Welcome to the Board of Education. Uh, this is a special Board of Education forum meeting. Um, and I will ask Mr. Jasinski to call the roll. Oh, me. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm here. Here. Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you so much. Happy to see you all here. I'm going to turn this over now to Superintendent Solon to start us off. Are you going up there? Good evening, everyone. Okay. I, I'm not going to beg for applause. I'm just, on the nicest night of the year, I'm just happy you're here. So I'm not going to beg for applause but, um, or welcome. But I do really appreciate you coming this evening because, uh, as I noted, it is probably the first day that it hasn't rained during monsoon season. And uh, I appreciate you taking time away to talk about uh, important topics that we have before us this evening. Um, tonight's agenda, I wanted to try and review some of the things that we've learned since March 18th and some of the work that's been done. In addition, um, I want to talk about a proposal for a District Safe School Climate Committee. Uh, I can give you some background on that and where that's coming from. You'll also have a wonderful opportunity this evening to get a snapshot of some of the student levin led social emotional initiatives that occur throughout our school system. Uh, one such initiative is in the back of the room this evening, our Ram Roasters from CHS, if you want to wave guys. Uh, thank you for coming. If you haven't seen them on the news, because they're, they're pretty popular, uh, they travel throughout CHS and offer um, coffee and water for sale um, through, through the high school throughout the day. So um, we will also touch on our developmental asset profile. Uh, I appreciate Michelle Piccarillo, the Director of Youth and Social Services, or Treasure Social Services, joining us this evening for that. And then at the end, we look to adjourn and engage the audience as, as we did after the last forum. Again, that's, that's valuable. So some of the key takeaways from our last forum that, you know, if we were looking to lump into themes would be transparency, responsiveness and supports and accountability. And that's what we're going to go through this evening. So in terms of transparency, um, some of the work that we've done and, and shared is the uh, definition of what mean-spirited behavior is, what bullying is, discrimination and, and harassment, and how to report that. I think that sometimes you know we go by what might be common jargon and unfortunately you know we have to adhere to legal definitions administratively so there are pretty clear uh, mandates around what those definitions are and I don't think that you know as a community when we're using um, different terms meaning different things it can be confusing and frustrating so what we tried to do was share out what those definitions were for our community and they're posted on our home page as well as the process that we use to investigate any of those behaviors. Um, it's pretty cut and dry, it's pretty clearly delineated and in an effort to you know share that and be more transparent that's also available all on our our home page. We also shared the Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act law. Now that um, is I think a, a, can be a source of frustration because when one student engages in mean-spirited behavior toward another and your child is the victim, I think you, you, it's a natural tendency to want to know, like, what happened to that student? What, what, what did they, you know, receive as a punishment? What's going on with them? And federal law prohibits us from sharing that information. And we talked about administratively. How do we support uh, the parent who might be frustrated by 
the factor that has that natural inquisition to want to know. Um, and it, I think we can, what we've talked about with our administrative team to try and resolve that is to not give, you can't give details. That's not allowed by law. But what we can do is help people understand in generic terms what sort of consequence happen for these sort of um, behaviors. So I think that that's already helped with some of the conversations we've had subsequently. So again, responsiveness and supports. I've talked a little bit about how do we respond to families and that's what I mean by, you know, um, nobody likes it when students mistreat one another. Um, certainly not the, the, the kids or the parents of the, the uh, victim. The administration doesn't like it. Teachers don't like it. Nobody likes it. So how do we um, express that empathy and also communicate understanding is one of the things that we've worked on administratively. We uh, continue to review our social emotional initiatives. There's a video, a pretty comprehensive video of our K-12 supports that's available on our website as well. Um, that, um, there's a packet available for you as well that has a pretty nice overview of the various uh, social emotional initiatives or supports that exist within our, our school system as well. We also reviewed uh, the bullying and harassment investigations protocol to make sure that you know it's it's crystal clear how that process works we did that with our attorney um, earlier in the year we um, also uh, wanted to take a look at our accountability piece which was the safe school climate committee and I don't think people understood and this has been a, a more recent communication as well what exactly is the safe school climate committee it's a uh, inner a variety of stakeholders um, administration teachers parents um, in some cases students who meet and review uh, statutorily a number of things that I'll, I'll get into momentarily one of those things is bullying investigation reports now because of FERPA the what I was just talking about parents and students are prohibited Clearly, right in the statute, it says parents and students can't do that. They can't be a part of that process. So um, there our staff does engage in that process already. Um, and they also, more recently, you might be familiar with our Safe School Climate Committee surveys. That's a state-mandated survey. I know there was previously some questions about the survey. The survey itself is uh, given to us by the state. We have to use... Uh, I think it's like 12 questions that they give us. Um, not, I wouldn't say that, you know, from a psychometrician's perspective that they're the greatest questions in the world, but um, we're required to use those questions that they provide. We also provide additional questions. I think they are uh, more fruitful for us, but um, that's where that survey comes from. So they review that, <coughs> those survey results and then develop a plan for the school on how to address areas of, of need within that survey. And also how to accentuate the strengths that exist as well. So um, one of the things that we were looking at to uh, support next level work in that was a district-wide safe school climate committee that is more reflective of the building-based committees that's more inclusive. So <clears throat> um, beyond the, the uh, disciplinary data, we wanted to also take a look at mental health data as well at this committee. Our district is focused on social emotional learning and we keep very good records about um, different needs that our students may have from a mental health perspective. Uh, we're not required to do so, but we, we track that information to see how, what sort of trends exist with our students, what sort of supports might they need. Um, frankly, it's been uh, a key piece of information that we've had to support uh, the demand for more mental health and, and supports uh, and counseling as well over the last couple of years, along with that, that being a stated goal. And so we're investing where we say is our priority is social emotional learning and that's where we've been investing with uh, school psychologists. 
So membership in this district-wide committee uh, should, and this is a proposal, by the way. This is a, a draft from me. This is the first time the board's hearing it in, in this sort of setting. Um, but, uh, you know, my thought was that it should include a member of the uh, curriculum committee as well as a member of the policy committee because information and decisions, uh, recommendations that come out of this group could influence uh, curriculum and policy. Uh, it should include a parent representative from each school, uh, the, the superintendent and the assistant superintendent is our designated safe school climate specialist, teachers and administrators, uh, representative of each level. So it, we, this is really to get a global view uh, from the district perspective to see um, you know, what, what we can do to support the district as a whole. So I talked about, you know, there are certain responsibilities at the building level for the Safe School Climate Committee. This is really uh, it. It's to identify and address patterns of bullying, uh, implement the Safe School and Security Plan regarding collection, evaluation, and reporting of information relating to instances of disturbing or threatening behavior that may not meet the definition of bullying. And I'm only reading this, reading this because I know if you're sitting in the back, it's probably like a two font for you. So um, I'm trying to help you out there. Uh, normally, I wouldn't read every bullet. To review and suggest amendments to policies related to bullying. To review and make recommendations to the district safe school climate coordinator regarding the district's safe school climate plan based upon issues and experiences across the district. And to educate the Cheshire community and parents about issues related to bullying. Now, that's not... Um, part of the building piece obviously that's really the the district piece that we're looking at educating the broader community and I think Michelle will talk a little bit too about how we as a broader community uh, work together to support our students so uh, extended responsibilities at the uh, district level I think are re review disciplinary pro protocols and related laws and policies make sure that information is disseminated uh, review de-identified disciplinary and mental health data and historical trends. Again, we can't look at individual circumstances, but um, global data. Um, review of the Safe School Climate Committee reports. Again, anything that doesn't include student uh, information. And review, review of social uh, emotional learning programs throughout the district. Uh, Safe School Climate Survey Structure Review, so we can review that. Um, we're required to give the Safe School Climate Survey every two years. Uh, we'll make budgetary recommendations to the superintendent to address any additional resources necessary uh, to support their recommendations. So right now, you know, we just complete, are completing our, our budget process. Uh, this is an opportunity for another voice uh, in that budget construction process that can give recommendations. So um, at this point, I've thrown a lot of information out there um, and tried to cover a lot of ground because we do have a number of other speakers this evening. But I wanted, you know, with our agenda to open the floor to any questions or, or comments on anything that I've covered. And if you just want to state your name and address for the record, please. I think you know the drill. Tim White, <clears throat> 11 Colonial Court, Cheshire. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. <laughs> sure. Um, we met two months ago. <clears throat> and at the time, I <clears throat> excuse me, requested greater transparency and accountability, which is what you're talking about here. I do see progress on that. So thank you for that. And I also want to say thank you to Adam for speaking up. Thank you. Liz, 570 Payne Drive. Uh, I'm not familiar with the audience of these mandated surveys. In other words, who gets to take them? Could you just sure. uh, explain the two surveys you mentioned, the mandated surveys, and who actually uh, completes them? Thank you. Absolutely. There's only one survey, actually, that goes out every two years. Uh, that survey is administered to our students, parents, and staff. The, the survey results are on our website as well.
for each building. Well, I'm glad that I got to go first because <clears throat> I know that I would not be able to uh, hang with the next set of presenters because uh, when you hear the amazing things that our students do on a regular basis to support other students in their school communities, I know that you'll be duly impressed. So um, I'd like to begin at the elementary level, kind of right in their hometown by introducing Highland Elementary School Principal Scott Jeffrey, who will talk to you about Not On My Bus. Yeah. I was going to say, hold your applause. Thank you. Okay, could I have the girls from Troop 60193 come on up? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Solon. Welcome, everyone, to Highland. Um, tonight, I would just want to talk to you a little bit about a program that was brought to my attention a little over a year ago. I had uh, this nice group of girls, and they were in fourth grade when they came to me with a project idea called Not On My Bus. And so I'm going to let them do the talking, but first I want them to introduce themselves. And I know this podium is pretty high, so I'm going to ask you to stand to the side so that everyone can see you. Um, my name is Ava Morse. I'm Adeline Galvin. I'm Rafia Pasha. I'm Mia Sorani. I'm Amelia Nielsen. I'm Lucy Salzman. So hold on to the mic and you can talk to the first slide, okay? Not On My Bus was designed by Girl Scout Troop 60193 to combat mean-spirited behavior on the bus. And to promote kind, respectful, and safe behaviors on the bus. Bus meetings and pledge tags are an important factor of this program. Students gather to receive an annual review of their bus expectations. Students take the Not On My Bus pledge to promise to demonstrate kind, respectful, and safe behaviors on the bus. The pledge was created by Troop 60193 members. Another big Part of the Not On My Bus program is the anonymous tip box. This allows students an, opportun an opportunity to report mean-spirited, disrespectful, or unsafe behaviors on the bus. Yellow tip boxes and purple reporting forms are located in, in, the, libra in the library and the office. Anonymous reports are collected by an administration for follow-up. Another important part is the bus of the month. Bus drivers complete a survey every other month to evaluate their students based on kind, respectful, and safe behaviors. Buses who earn the highest scores earn the bus of the month honors. A picture of the students and the bus driver are posted in our main lobby. Students and the driver earn a star to prominently display on the bus. Yes. So every part of this program, the girls designed <clears throat> from the logo that they have, that logo was transferred onto a tag that every student who said the pledge at Highland, 750 students, recited the pledge in bus meetings, and they each received a tag that they prominently uh, put onto their book bag. So if you see their book bags, they all have the tags. The tag says that they've recited the pledge, and they've made that pledge to demonstrate kind, respectful, and safe behaviors on the bus. Um, the tip box was the girls. And so we have two tip boxes, and we go into the tip box, and we pull those reporting forms out, and we investigate. And a lot of times they might not have names. They might say a third grader on bus three did this to me. So we investigate and we do our best to learn as much as possible. Um, the stars on the bus, the, it's, it's, not a, um, <clears throat> it's not a popsicle. 
It's not a prize, but all the kids on the bus, when I come on the bus, when they've won that uh, star and they see me getting ready to stick it onto the window, are cheering. They're excited about that. So that's prominently displayed. So all these pieces are really the girls doing. They came to me last year, as I said. We've talked uh, throughout the end of the last year. We put these in place over the summer and we started uh, the year with the Not On My Bus program. Our next steps, we'll be meeting at the end of this month and we'll be talking about next year, looking to see how we can continue to grow and improve with that. So I'd like to thank Ava, Adeline, Rafia, Amelia, Mia, and Lucy for all their hard work and their leaders as well. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for all so you can come down. Like I said, I didn't want to follow that. Um, the next presenter that we're going to have as we move up the K-12 continuum is from Dodd Middle School. Our unified sports program has really been uh, an incredible, incredible opportunity for all students to be engaged in athletics in our, our school system. And I want to welcome uh, the gentleman who is coordinating our Unified Sports Program at Dodd Middle School at the moment, Mr. Matt Rapetsky, to uh, introduce the program and talk a little bit about it. It's good evening. Next year, Ava, we'll get the technology going. <laughs> All right. Uh, so again, I'm Matt Rapetsky. Uh, thank you guys for having us here tonight. My trusty sidekick over here, this is Ava. She is a seventh grade student, um, and she, she is also a peer helper um, with our unified sports team. Very briefly, just some background info. Um, we are bringing it back this year, and originally in the fall for our first sport um, for soccer, we had nine students in total, um, but over time we were able to grow that to now 20 plus students who are involved with our program. Um, it is to the point where when now kids ask me all the time, when can I be involved? I'm in this sports season. Um, so it's been a great experience as it's grown a little bit um, and as interest has grown. Um, we have played in sports tournaments. We've traveled to other schools. We have played during halftime uh, for especially the boys basketball team, the girls basketball team um, when they are home at Dodd. We have had a nice home game this year for basketball. We had a nice home crowd. Uh, the boys and the girls team especially came out to support us. Um, and we were also able to reach out in the community um, and have a nice time at the health fair as well. Um, something that I've noticed from my perspective, and then Ava uh, in a second will share something from her perspective, was that students were not only actively participating and engaged and having fun, um, but they started to build some of those relationships. They started to walk in the halls together. They started to share lunch together. Um, they started, started to do a lot of those things together, um, which was really nice to see. Um, at the beginning, I don't know if it was the Katy Perry on the bus rides um, or if it was actually playing in the events, but you can start to see those bonds um, kind of organically evolve, um, which was great. Um, and again, even players on other teams, they would come together, they knew Southington players, they were able to reach out and were able to build our program based on connections that they already had as well. Um, so again, uh, a very good time visiting all of those places. Um, our future plan is to get as many students in who would like to participate, um, keep growing, and ultimately not only build relationships and uh, have those smiles each and every day and have a positive experience, but to leave with those friendships, to wanna go to high school and keep on building um, and have students like Ava involved and impacted from this as well. Um, so thank you uh, for all your support. I know some people are here who support us and, and they'll never say no um, to anything that we ask for. So thank you guys. And um, I know Ava has a piece that she would like to share as well. Hello. I first began um, playing basketball after hearing about the program because I thought it was something I would enjoy. During practice, I noticed kids working together and they were all having fun. On the day of our game, I saw my team wishing luck to everyone and everyone was smiling. They were so excited. My bus ride up to the game was awesome. I think every single kid was bouncing up and down, ready to have fun. The bu During the game, I noticed how connected our team had become. 
Everyone was helping each other. Not only that, but the other teams cheered on everyone. Following the game, I realized how close I had become to my peers. I already missed playing the game. Unifoid Sports has impacted me by teaching me how to be more kind to everyone, no matter what. It also helped me be more connected with my peers that I don't see every day. I really had a blast. Thank you guys, thank you. If you are at all, at all into athletics and you have not been to a unified sports event yet, I strongly encourage you attending, you know, to see so much incredible spirit, camaraderie, and love of sport. Uh, it is really special to be a part of. So I certainly encourage you to, to try and see one of our upcoming events. But um, thank you very much, Matt and Ava. Um, now I'd like to pass it off to, I guess, Dr. Gad, is that right? Or Ms. Piccarillo, who wants to talk about Challenge Day? Ms. Piccarillo? All right. Hi. Um, so in a few mom moments, I'm going to talk with you about the developmental asset survey that we did in the fall of 2018. When we originally did this survey um, with young people in grades 7 through 12 in this community in 2015, we held a youth retreat following the data, the release of the data report to process the data and give it some context. And out of the youth retreat, while we were there, young people communicated to us that they would like to see more school-wide programming to address empathy and tolerance and the valuing diversity. And so we did some research and we found a program called Challenge Day. Um, I reached out to Dan Tartarelli, who without him this could not happen for sure, um, and he agreed to help me coordinate the program, um, and it ran for its third time this year in the spring at the high school. It's a program that trains 100 students, uh, representing a cross-section of the student population and 25 faculty. They spend a full day together, and I'm going to read a paragraph to you um, of what their mission is, which is what sort of sold me on the program in the first place. This program goes beyond traditional anti-bullying efforts, building empathy and inspiring a school-wide movement of compassion and positive change. They address some common issues seen in most schools, including cliques, gossip, rumors, negative judgments, teasing, harassment, isolation, stereotypes, intolerance, racism, sexism, bullying, violence, suicide, homophobia, hopelessness, apathy, and hidden pressures to create an image, achieve, or live up to the expectations of others. Um, I've asked for students to come who participated in Challenge Day who are going to share with you their experience, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Um, I'm very grateful that they're here, and they're wonderful young people. Hello, I'm Ian Osborne, and I'm a sophomore. I'm Emily Nash, and I'm in 11th grade. I'm Maddie Lawrence, I'm also in 11th grade. And I'm Jack Genzel, and I'm in uh, 10th grade. Hello, everyone. Um, so my experience with Challenge Day was I, I got a letter from one of the guidance counselors, and I didn't really know what it was about, but it was something that um, 100 kids were randomly chosen to do, um, mostly sophomores with junior um, teen leaders. And Challenge Day really impacted me in a way that I didn't think it would because I was a attendant of um, Highland Elementary School and over the course of my time we had had speakers um, come in and talk about bullying and certain issues in the school climate. But Challenge Day was different in a way that it wasn't just a speaker speaking to the kids but it was interactive in that there were certain activities um, which we can go into more depth on. but. Um, the, the, we did a crossing the line activity and we were put in small family groups which really forced us to um, be empathetic and open and communi uh, communicative with our peers and fellow teachers who also volunteered to do the work. And <clears throat> um, I, thought, I thought it was a really, really powerful um, event and it, it really bonded the school community and it taught it so for instance in my personal experience I've been dealing with problems with for instance my family um, recently got divorced over the summer and internalizing that um, through myself but with challenge day it 
um, gave me the opportunity to look at that and reflect on that and see that I'm not alone in that and that other people are dealing with the same things that I'm dealing with and um, sort of create bonds that we didn't even know we had. So. Um, so, in, when I was in 10th grade, I was asked to come to Challenge Day, just like everyone else, where you get a letter randomly. Um, and it was, I really didn't know what to expect, because I hadn't heard about it before, because it was the second year it had run. And um, I went in kind of just open-minded, completely willing to just see what it was about, what was going to happen. And um, I, the day went on, and it was full of just interactive, hearing people that I didn't ever talk to before, because you are completely just thrown into this with 100 people that you either have talked to or have not talked to and they force you to be with people that you wouldn't just be like that's my best friend I'm going to go with them and so it was fascinating to see that and to experience that and then I was asked back um, this year uh, to be one of the you know teen like team members of the for the 11th grade to go in and kind of pump up the new people coming in because it's scary you get thrown in and they make you stand up and like dance it's fun <laughs> but um, I was asked back and immediately, without a, a doubt, I said yes, because I had such a great time experiencing it for myself to go and watch other people experience it and to hear what they had to say would something I just immediately wanted. And my favorite part about it, it wasn't really what happened during that day, but it was afterwards, you know, hearing people in the hallway after on the bus or a couple of days after talking about how even if they didn't do much that day, what they saw or how it affected them. You would hear people that may have not talked at all during that day, but said, it was a great day because I learned this, or I learned this about this person, or I talked to this person. It wasn't just, I got out of school for a day. They always had some reason why it affected them personally, and that always moved me, and I'm, I hope that this continues to happen for years and years to come, because it was just fascinating for me to see all these people together in one room for a day, adults and students talking and communicating about things that don't normally get talked about, so it was fascinating to me. Thank you. <laughs> so I also had the privilege to go twice. Um, going in as a leader, uh, I was hearing all the sophomores come in thinking this was going to be completely ridiculous. Like they came in not, not knowing what to expect, but at the end of it, I saw these bonds form. They're, everyone connected, everyone participated, everyone ended up participating, and they did not think it was stupid. They were affected by it, and I saw it. Going in as a leader, I was able to um, bring people's personalities out, and I was able to see all these people affect different people in different ways. Even if they had never known each other, or never talked, even if they're in the same grade, somehow they did affect each other with this activity and I thought that was really really cool because at the end of it everyone connected so my challenge day experience was a little different because I have an older sibling and I, I know a lot of uh, seniors in high school so when I was like what is challenge day they told me well you're probably gonna cry and the you know, that scared me a little bit. Uh, so going into it with all these different sophomores, uh, as the other uh, teens here, they said, you know, uh, you see like the different cliques and you see the different groups of people that kind of stay isolated from each other at first. And really towards the end of the day, it didn't matter who you are, what you did, gender, anything, like everybody was brought together. And I think that Challenge Day was a really valuable experience because I took that information and like, you can, you can use that, like I spread, spread that. And I believe that everyone here and everyone who went to Challenge Day had that positive experience and they will continue to spread that positivity and empathy and yeah. So this is a program that, um, with the school's blessing, we will be bringing back um, for many years to come. As you can see, it's really impactful, and we believe it's changing our school community for the better. So thank you very much.
You can consider it blessed, Michelle. They'll be coming back. But, um, you know, I think that presentation is really kind of the embodiment of something I was, I was writing earlier today. We'll be issuing a press release probably tomorrow about, you know, we saw substantial gains on the SAT in math and, and uh, reading and writing. Um, and we were acknowledged by, the, by an organization that uh, great schools that um, recognizes schools for high schools for their success and preparing kids that are successful at the next level. And in that press release, I wrote that, you know, while it's nice to be acknowledged for that, our focus is on graduating people, not, not SAT scores. And we try and focus on the bigger picture. And that presentation was really just the embodiment of it. The, you know, the skills and talents are important to be able to, to be able to calculate and write and communicate. But uh, equally as important is the ability to um, feel purpose as a human being and feel connected to others. And um, that's really the em embodiment of, of the, that effort. So thank you, Michelle, and uh, all of our students who participate in that, and Dan and everybody at the high school for your work with that as well. This next group um, will only further reinforce that last presentation from Cheshire High School. So I'd like to welcome up Dr. Gad to introduce our peer health educators. These are some young people who really need no introduction. Paige Remlard and Aaron Daly have been working with our peer health educators class, and they have brought some extraordinary connections among all of our schools relative to social and emotional learning. So without further ado, Paige Remlard and Aaron Daly. Hi everyone, so today we're gonna to talk about our peer health class, which I know we talked last week to most of you guys about it, but there's some other things that we're gonna add. Um, so we hope that you guys are interested in learning about it because we love doing it. We do. Okay, so peer health is a elective senior class which 25 students in the senior class get selected based on leadership um, qualities that they exhibit. Um, throughout the year, we do multiple programs throughout the school, pr the public schools and um, other things like this year we've done the penguin plunge to rate we raised thirty two hundred dollars that came half of it came back for our unified basketball tournament last week we did our excellence in leadership conference which hosted almost 400 students from across the state and then yesterday Paige put on a great leadership conference at Holiday Hill for the middle school which was amazing and we should all give her a round of applause for that So each year, the peer health class does a mission statement based on what we want to get out of our um, school year and what we want to exhibit as our leadership. So um, we, we get together, the class forms smaller groups, and we put down our ideas of what we think our mission statement should be, and then we come together and decide on, on what it is. And this, I believe, really reflects our intention and just the, the purpose of our class. So a peer health educator helps develop a sense of unity within a community by being open-minded, approachable, and caring. They are role models who demonstrate leadership qualities as well as take on challenges and embody many attributes of leaders. They are willing to take on inconvenience for the betterment of others. This mission statement is something that we try to um, include in all of the activities that we host and also in everyday class. Um, throughout our um, school year, we do multiple things to get connected with other students throughout the school community. Um, so far this year, we've done 11th grade um, health classes where we talked about um, post high school planning since we had just gone through that process, gave them kind of a more um, real perspective on what they're gonna do. Um, we aim to grow relationships between the high school age students and elementary age students. We do that by um, fourth grade um, PE class visits where we talk about sportsmanship in sports and also outside of sports. And then we wanna bridge the gap between high school, middle school, and elementary school because we are all students at Cheshire Public Schools and we should all be feel connected because we're all the same, not based on age. 
and we want to have a positive influence to direct our peers. This year we started something new, which is um, the Elementary School Kindness, in kindness Initiative. Um, we developed this during the peer health class. Um, we, you know, there's mean-spirited behavior everywhere in life, not just in school. You're gonna, you know, have it no matter where you are. So if we try to, you know, teach these kids from a young age how to deal with it, um, even if it's not fitting the definition of bullying, it still shouldn't be happening. And you know, it happened to all of us when we're through school. So just helping them and teaching them how to deal with it, and also like every other thing that we've gone through through our school career, we try to help these younger kids try to go through that. So something else that was actually started last year is the Student Advisory Council. And this was brought on by, so Coach Stanley, he had this idea and after consulting with some other adults in the building, they decided that a group in within the school that can serve as a bit of a liaison between administrators and teachers and the students. So this group of students, um, we, I know Aaron and I are involved in this. So it's a student-led group that coordinates student leadership opportunities at CHS. So we focus on this idea of everyday leadership and how being a leader, you don't need a title or a certain position in order to embody those qualities. It's really that idea of what can I do every day that will uh, you know, exemplify what a leader is and how can I contribute to my community. So that is what this group is all about. And we're here to serve many functions, whether that's discussing a concern that maybe Dr. Gad has and she wants some student feedback, or maybe it's starting a community service project or just talking with students who might need help on certain things. So it, and as I said, yes, it serves as a sounding board for the administration. So this is a, a very, uh, great idea that I think will only continue to grow in the future. So as Aaron said before, yesterday we held the second annual Reconnect, a leadership experience event at Holiday Hill. Last year I was a student in uh, Don DeMeo's leadership uh, class and we were each given, there were six of us in the class last year and we were each given an opportunity to, it was this open-ended chance to create our own community outreach project or event or really take any form that we wanted. So um, at, this started as a small idea and after networking with uh, people within CHS and Dodd, I decided that I wanted to do something that would connect Cheshire High School and Dodd Middle School. And my purpose for this is with just something that I've noticed in my experience, and I know that my peers notice as well, in our generation with the technology and social media, media being at the forefront in a lot of things, it seems to me that a real like powerful human connection has been a bit put uh, you know, on the back burner, and those skills that are needed in order to cultivate those meaningful relationships and really reconnect with people, uh, which is what a leader does. A leader is a connector, and um, that is what the message that I wanted to send. And I felt that middle school years are very formative years, so that is why I chose that group to be involved. So um, we, ho we host 50 students from Dodd, about 25 from each grade, and they're they will join about 25 leadership mentors. So these are CHS students, CHS teachers, and Dodd teachers. And just for a day of leadership, team building, emotional intelligence-based activities, and with a motivational presentation by uh, CHS grad Sebastian Little, and lunch with a leader, which is another uh, portion of our day. So really human connection, being present, living with a leadership mindset and making a difference are the key points that I really wanted to target with this. And through that, I would hope that these students can grow in confidence, strengthen their interpersonal skills, boost their self-esteem and their overall positivity as they learn to lead more fulfilling lives. And there are two pictures up here from yesterday. The one on the bottom right is the entire group and the one up on top is myself, uh, Ms. DeMeo, Sebastian Little, and Coach Lee. This event is funded by the Ryan T. Lee Memorial Foundation, and without uh, Coach Lee's generosity, this event wouldn't happen. So big thanks to him and everyone else. 
So going along with bridging the gap between the different levels of school, the a, an idea is to have an elementary school leadership conference and that would ensure that we would hit every level. So we already have one for the high school, we have one for the middle school, and to have one for the elementary school would be great. So this would be planned for next school year and we would include students from all four elementary schools and it would be organized and led by CHS students. This would as I said, you know, align the middle school conference with the high school conference. And again, having that everyday leadership focus, and that is something that is um, highlighted on all three levels. And we would do like how to, team building, problem solving, and collaboration. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much for having us and giving us the chance to speak to you. Nice job, ladies, and thank you so much for not only that presentation, but all you do in our high school community and beyond, really. And I know that, you know, pretty much all of our speakers tonight, if I asked them to be here at 3 a.m. to present, they would be, okay, well, should I be here at 245? Because they're that enthused about the work that they do and the influence that they have. So, you know, those, those connections and that work is, is very powerful. So. Thank you all, for all of our student presenters for everything you shared tonight and giving us a taste of all the activities that we provide for social emotional learning through that K-12 continuum. So as I promised, uh, Michelle Piccarillo is here, our Director of Social Services, to walk you through our developmental asset profile. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so what I'm going to do for you tonight is give you sort of a preliminary look at the data collection results um, from this fall's data collection. Um, it actually takes, despite the fact that the Search Institute provides us with a very comprehensive report, it takes a while to really give the data context and understand why young people answered questions the way that they do. And so we haven't gotten to that point fully, but I'm going to present some preliminary data to you. Um, I'm not sure I know how to use this, so, okay. Um, so the Search Institute um, out in Minnesota, they um, have behind them 30 plus years of research and surveys on po positive youth development. Um, over on this table here, I did not anticipate that everybody would be as interested in this stuff as I am, um, but there is a um, printout of the executive summary and the complete survey um, report from the data collection this fall. There's a worksheet that details the um, developmental asset framework and the 40 developmental assets, um, as well as an article um, regarding the value of developmental relationships and how they can impact young people. So that's all information that sort of backs up the Search Institute and their research over the years. Um, the 40 developmental assets, which is the foundation for the survey instrument that we used, um, include essential skills, abilities, and competencies all youth need to grow to be successful, caring, responsible adults. Um, in the past 20 years, the developmental assets framework has become the most frequently cited positive youth development approach in the world. Um, when I reference national data in this presentation, it's based upon 121,157 young people in grades 6 through 12 um, who completed the Profile of Student Life Attitudes and Behavior Survey between 2012 and 2015, and that is the same survey that we administered here. Um, so just to give you um, the logistical information, with permission from the Cheshire Board of Education and support from the Cheshire Human Services Department, data collection um, was conducted that surveyed all young people in grades 7 through 12. Um, the point of the survey was to help identify priority areas for the community's work with youth of all ages. Um, after focus groups are conducted with a cross-section of youth and other stakeholders from the town of Cheshire, we'll use those focus groups to really identify what the key priorities are, are areas are at that point. Um, Although the same survey was conducted in 2015, we're encouraged not to compare data from that year to this year, but it is helpful to look at snapshots in time and see where our kids were at back then and where they are now. Okay, 
Um, I am going to present some national data. Um, the Search Institute suggests that we do not compare our young people to the national data because it's not the same kind of sample. However, it is helpful to get sort of an overview and see where our kids are and compare to other kids in comparison to other kids across the country. Um, and I think it's helpful to put the data in context in that way. Um, the Search Institute identifies benchmarks for the assets. It's important, however, that our community looks at where our children are and decide what we want our goals to be in terms of the developmental assets and how many we would like our children to have. Um, so some reference points. In terms of national data, oh, I forgot to flip my slides. Nobody told me I wasn't changing the slides. <laughs> okay. So in terms of national data, um, I already told you the number of youth, 121,157. Um, total number of assets um, nationally is 20.6. Um, from small size cities, the state is a little bit old. It's from 2010, the average is 20.4. Um, Cheshire data in 2015, total number of assets was 21.7. Um, and Cheshire data in 2018, um, total number again was 21.7 assets. Um, so to use the survey results over time, like I said, it's best to just look at it and look for a snapshot of where our kids are in one place, you know, one year to the next. Um, when reviewing the survey results, in the event that you do decide to take one of those very lengthy reports over here, um, give additional consideration to survey differences. I'm really not doing a good job with this PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> Uh, give additional consideration to survey differences of five percentage points or more between grade, grade levels and between males and females. And when I go over the data with you, you will see that we do have some significant differences there. Um, look for patterns of finding rather than focusing on a specific asset level. So in this survey um, in 2018, we surveyed 1,714 young people. Um, our intent was to survey all young people in grades 7 through 12. We had less than five opt-outs. Um, parents were given the opportunity to opt their child out of the survey. Um, we had less than five opt-outs. Opt -outs. 221 surveys, which was 12% of our total sample, was discarded. Um, and the survey, the Search Institute discards surveys because um, the, they're not valid. And they determined that through patterns of answering questions, um, large amounts of survey questions left unanswered. Um, this, it was interesting because in 2015 when we did the survey, only 3% of the surveys had to be discarded for those reasons. Um, but when I questioned this, my understanding understanding that it's because now the survey is online and it's much easier for young people to just decide not to answer the rest of the questions and click out of the survey. So um, the average number of surveys that are discarded is between 15 and 25 percent. Um, so we're well, within a, um, we're well within a valid data sample there. Um, approximately 91 percent of our young people in grades 7 through 12 participated in the survey. Um, so as I mentioned, the Search Institute has some benchmarks. Um, they prefer that all youth have 31 to 40 developmental assets, um, that all youth experience only one or none of the five developmental deficits, that all youth engage in only two or fewer of the 10 high risk behavior patterns, um, and that all youth have at least six of the eight thriving indicators. So where are we now? Um, as we look at the data from this year's um, survey, um, like I said, 21.7 assets out of the total sample surveyed. Um, and through the grade levels, it's relatively consistent. So the assets remain the same th from grades 7 through 12, which I think is encouraging. We're not losing um, a tremendous amount of assets from grades 7 through 12, which does, sometimes does happen. Um, so I'm realizing as I look at this up on the screen that you can't see that, right? The table? <laughs> okay. So I'm just going to highlight some of the things that I found really encouraging about our survey data and then talk about some of the things that were a little bit discouraging and that I think we need, think we need to work on. Um, so um, in terms of the category of support, 78% of our young people report that they have a lot of family support, which I think is wonderful. 82% um, report a positive peer influence, which means that um, young person's best friends model responsible behavior. I think that is so encouraging, that our, our young people think that they're surrounded by people who are a positive influence on them. Um, 
And then 72% um, of our young people are involved in youth programs, whether it's sports clubs or extracurricular activities, which is also wonderful. Um, where we might need some improvement is that, um, interestingly enough, and I found this a bit surprising, only 25% of our young people reported that there was a high level of parent involvement in schooling. Um, and 24% um, of our young people reported that our community values youth. Um, interestingly enough, um, only about half of our young people reported that they feel safe at home, in school, and in their neighborhood, which I also find a bit surprising. Um, and we have only 22% of our young people that report involvement in creative activities, um, which would be music, theater, or other arts, which I, again, um, that surprises me because I feel like that number should be higher. Um, and so that's something that we're going to look at when we talk to the young people and find out why the questions were answered the way that they were answered. Um, so some trends in terms of responses, in terms of parent involvement in schooling, if you, I don't know if you can see this, but in grade seven, 35% of our young people report that there's a high level of parent involvement in schooling. Um, by grade 12, we're at 12%. So there's a significant, significant in decrease, which makes sense given the level of independence that young people um, gain as they get older. Um, but it is, it is something of note. Um, if we look under empowerment at service to others, um, there's a great difference between males and females. Um, only 40% of our males identify that they, um, they have the asset of providing service to others while 57% of our females do. Um, and in terms of safety, 60% of our males, our males identify that they are safe in their neighborhood, school, and community, and only 46% of our females. So there's a big difference there as well. So that's something else that we need to look at and understand why, our, why the young men in our community feel safer than the young women um, and, find, and give that data some context. Um, in addition, in regards to safety, um, in seventh grade, 40% of our young people report that they feel safe. Um, but by the time they hit 12th grade, 12th grade, it's up to 65%. Um, so looking at why that difference exists as well is important. Um, again, um, positive field peer influence I was really encouraged by. Um, seventh grade, 96% of our seventh graders report that they're surrounded by positive peer influences. So I think that's wonderful. Um, Okay, and as we move on, um, I'm not going to go through all of the tables because we'll be here all night, um, and I'm sure none of you want to do that. Um, but I do just want to highlight a few more um, interesting things. So um, if we look at um, positive identity, which is down on the bottom here, in terms of self-esteem, oh, that's the wrong one. Sorry. Okay. In terms of um, self-esteem, 45% um, of our young people report the as having high self-esteem. Um, this number is actually down 9% from 2015, um, which I thought was, was interesting and, and worrisome, to be honest. Um, as we look at um, positive values like caring, our youth report high numbers in regards to, to caring and things like that, which I think is wonder, wonderful. Equality and social justice, 70%. Integrity, 78%. Honesty and responsibility are both at 76%. Res, uh, percent. Restraint is, is an area that you always need to work on with adolescents, um, just because it's something that they struggle with. And the fact that we're at 52% is pretty consistent with, um, with numbers you know, across the country, really. So um, in regards to the internal assets, we have some major gender differences here as well. Um, so in terms of achievement and motivation, our males are at 75%, our females are at 86%, so much higher for females. Um, school engagement is also higher for females. Um, responsibility to do homework is higher for females. Bonding to school is also higher for females. Um, and most of our internal assets, the females rate higher until we get down to positive identity, like personal power, self-esteem, sense of purpose, and personal view, positive view of personal future, where in most cases, the males rate higher than our females. So we really need to spend some time with our girls and boys and figure out you know, why they're feeling the way that they're feeling and why they're answering the questions this way. Um, So 
So as we look at the developmental deficits, which are the neg negative influences that it can interfere with the ability to develop into a healthy, successful adult, um, time spent alone at home, TV overexposure, physical abuse, and victim of violence and drinking parties. So these are, these are how our kids scores um, in these areas. Um, and again, they're relatively consistent with other young people their age in similar communities. Um, what I will say um, that was a bit encouraging was when we look at the drinking parties, the percentage um, that reported that they had been involved in a party where there was um, alcohol or drinking is down 6% from 2015. So I found that to be a bit encouraging. We'd certainly like it to be lower, though. Um, and I'm gonna, okay. And then um, there are eight thriving indicators. Um, succeeds in school, helps others, values diversity, maintains good health, exhibits leadership, resists danger, delays gratification, and overcomes adversity. Um, so in terms of helping others, we're at 78%. Um, so that's wonderful. It means we have young people who are concerned about their peers and other people in their community. Um, in terms of valuing diversity, we're at 66%, which is up 7% from what was reported in 2015. Um, so I was really pleased to see that. 76% of our young people um, report that they exhibit leadership. Um, I was a bit concerned with the number on resist danger. Um, that's only at 20, 28%. That's a number that we certainly want to explore and talk to our kids about and find out why they're, um, they're not feeling like they need to resist danger a bit, a bit more. Okay. Um, Another um, interesting um, difference was be the gender difference when it comes to valuing diversity. So we had 58% of our males reporting that they value diversity and 73% of our females. So again, talking to our kids about why you know, males are seeing this as less important than females and, and giving that data some sort of context. Um, in terms of resisting danger, 23% um, of our um, males report that they have that asset as opposed to 33% of our females. Um, in terms of delaying gratification, males and females are on the same page, 57% um, for that. So there are 10 high risk behaviors that are identified and these are our numbers here. Um, and so, you know, the percentages look relatively low until you, feel, you attach the actual numbers of youth to them. Um, and so um, when you look at depression and suicide, um, when you look at marijuana use, um, and interestingly enough, I did not expect this to um, be the case, but marijuana use is down 14% from 2015. And again, they say not to compare the years, um, but I was very surprised to see that I definitely would have expected a different result. So, f so talking again to our kids and giving that some context is I think is really interesting. Um, you know, I'm concerned about the depression suicide number, I think 20% is a high number um, and I think we need to again talk to our kids about their mental health and how they're feeling um, and figure out why they're answering those questions that way. So the whole sort of basis of the developmental assets is that um, the Search Institute has done research that shows that the more assets a young person has, the less likely they are to participate in youth risky behaviors. And so there's a prevention element to the developmental assets um, that we like to focus on. And so, um, so they do talk about um, prevention. And so some of the questions they ask are in regards to alcohol, tobacco, other drugs, and whatnot. And so just looking quickly at some, you know, some trends um, in alcohol, used alcohol once or more in the last 30 days. Um, you know, if you look at the percentages in seventh grade low, it gets much higher by 12th grade, we're up to 40%. But there also, you know, there's a difference between sort of ninth grade, if you look at ninth grade to 12th grade, um, and there seems to be a slight jump from 10th to 11th. Um, the same is true of the got drunk once or more in the last two weeks. There's a jump between grades 10 and 11. So that might be something that we look at and talk to our 10th graders and 11th graders and find out what's happening there that might be leading to that increase. Um, again, when we go down to marijuana, there's a jump between grade 10 and 11 from 12% to 22%. Um, and that is also consistent with our 2015 data. There was an increase between those two grades as well. Um, so again, these are more of additional risk-taking behaviors. Um, and again, I do want to just stress that although these no the percentages may look low when you attach them to numbers, in some cases you're talking about hundreds of kids. Um, so if you have an opportunity to look over some of the, the data tables, definitely keep that in mind. Um, 
when we go down this list to depression, we see that there is a jump again between grades 10 and 11 um, from 15% to 22%. So we really need to spend some time with our sophomores trying to understand what's happening. Um, if substance abuse is increasing, mental health issues may be increasing, um, finding out where they're at and what they're dealing with at that, at that age. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go past the tables now. Um, so this is um, the asset challenge facing our community. Um, so 7% um, of our community has zero to 10 assets. Um, we would like to be at 31 to 40 assets for all of our young people and only 13% of our young people have 31 to 40 assets. 41% um, have 21 to 30, which is you know still relatively good, but we wanna see this pie chart change a little bit so that the 13% um, grows quite a bit. So in terms of developmental relationships, and there is, um, which is what makes this research so important, and like I said, there's an article about this on this table over here. Um, what, has been, what has been proven is that surrounding people with a web of positive relationships contributes to greater resilience. Um, when, when young people experience developmental relationships, they do better on a variety of indicators. Um, and the elements of a developmental relationship ship is they're relatively basic. Express care, show me that I matter. Challenge growth, push me to keep getting better. Provide support, help me complete tasks and achieve goals. Share power, um, treat me with respect and give me a say. And expand possibilities, connect me with people and places that broaden my world. If we can do that for our young people, we will help them immensely. So what next? Um, how do our youth today compare with those in the same grades across the state and nation? So what I did, and I don't know if you can see this slide, um, and I won't spend too much time on this, but um, the slide, the pie chart on the left is, is the national data, right? So if you compare those two charts, they look relatively similar. Um, so we're not too far off nationally where other kids are, um, but that doesn't mean that we don't wanna change our pie chart and make it look different and have more of our kids in that 31 to 40 asset category. But I do think we can um, you know, feel a bit comfortable knowing that our kids are sort of where it looks like other kids are, um, but we can also want more for our young people. Um, and then I, I just looked at some of the national data sets in regards to integrity, achievement motivation, family support, positive view of personal future, positive peer influence and honesty and responsibility, just to sort of we see where we compare to the, the national data. And we're pretty much at the same level or higher on all of those, in all of those areas, which I find encouraging. And I, I can't say enough about the positive peer influence piece in our community. Um, we're 10% above the national average in that area. And I think that really speaks to the young people um, and how they regard each other. Um, in terms of the least common assets, again, we're kind of right around where, um, where other kids are. Um, positive family communication. Um, it's interesting that family support is really high and then positive family communication is so low. There's a big um, difference there and I would love to f talk to our kids and find out why that is. Um, youth as resources, adult role models, parent involvement in schooling, community values youth, reading for pleasure and creative activities. When I look at the community values youth number, um, there's something wrong in the way that we're communicating to our young people how we feel about them because I know this community values youth um, and, and I've seen that in practice. So really finding better ways to communicate to our young people that we care about each other, that we care about them and that we care, they, we value them as a part of this community is, is so important. So that's something that we're gonna have to look at and work on. Okay. So um, in terms of next steps, um, so what direction do the survey results provide about setting priorities for our collective work to increase developmental assets for youth? So this is something that, again, we need to do more work in sort of assessing the data and having some focus groups and giving this data some context. Um, in terms of what, what I'm looking for um, from our community um, is that everybody in this community is an asset builder. Every single adult in this community has the potential to build assets in a young person. And that could be whether you're a teacher, a coach, a dance instructor, whether you work at the grocery store um, or the bank, whenever, whenever you have an opportunity to come into contact with a young person, you have an opportunity to influence them positively. And so I would love to see our community embrace the 40 developmental assets and keep them in mind when they're, when they're um, meeting with young people out in the community. Um, having a consistent community 
approach around this, promoting developmental relationships, setting interim, interim asset targets. So trying to look to increase the number of assets in our young people you know, over short periods of time, uh, leading to a larger result in the end. Um, and then looking at the existing programs and deciding what we should continue and expand and what we need to change or take away. What are we not doing well? What programs aren't working? What programs aren't positively impacting our young people? And then making those changes as we see fit. Um, so st the steps that we need to take to understand the data more fully, as I said, um, we will we'll be conducting focus groups with multiple sectors of the community. Um, youth focus groups are most helpful in giving the data context, but it's also helpful for us to meet with teachers and school administrators and again coaches and um, other people out in the community that might be clinicians, mental health providers, pediatricians, trying to give this data some context. Um, we will be looking to form a community coalition um, to develop our community approach. Um, the following sectors will be represented, youth, parents, business community, media schools, youth serving organizations, law enforcement agencies, religious or fraternal organizations, civic and volunteer groups, healthcare professionals, local government, and public health. Um, we are going to look to incorporate asset building plans into the community and school messages. Um, we are going to encourage staff to participate in planning and invitation, implementation of the 40 developmental asset framework concepts and positive youth development activities that address youth identifi identified priori priority areas and next steps. Um, and encourage the publication of town and school data related to positive youth development, youth identified priority areas, and next steps along with preventative strategies. Um, and I forgot to change the slide again. Sorry about that. Um, in terms of supporting the community, um, we are going to be looking to apply for a drug-free communities grant. Um, the RFP has just come out. Um, that is a grant that we have been hoping to apply for for many years in this community, but without a valid data set, we were unable to do so. But now that we have two rounds of data collection with the Search Institute's data collection instrument, we're in a position to apply for this grant. Um, and this grant, it's a large grant. It's up to $125,000 per year over a five-year period um, and it funds coalitions to, to that are working to prevent and reduce substance abuse among youth. Um, the um, drug-free communities grant, the people who approve those applications um, value the Search Institute data so this puts us in a great position to successfully apply for one of those grants. Um, okay. And, um, and that is that concludes my presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'll certainly hang around um, for that or you know I'm happy to entertain them here. Like I said, um, there's more information on that table or certainly you can reach out to me over the next um, you know the next few months and, and ask. And um, if you have feedback after reviewing the data or you see something that strikes you as interesting or notable, please don't hesitate to reach out to me because um, the document's a hundred and something pages long and um, I tend to have a focus issue every once in a while, so there might be something that I miss. So feel free to reach out and let me know if there's something that you see that maybe I missed or that I, I didn't. So I'd appreciate the help in that. Okay. Once again, I, I do want to thank Ms. Piccarillo because not uh, every town has the incredible relationship that we do with our social service department. Um, and I know we rely heavily on each other to support the students and families in our community. And this is one example of that. And I, I really appreciate that, that relationship. So thank you, Michelle. Um, so at this point, I know that our board is eager to interact uh, with anybody who wishes to do so. so. I guess it's a, if anybody wanted to make a motion to adjourn or if you had a question. Would you like to make a comment? Thank you, Madam Chairman, for the microphone. Um, I just want to thank everyone tonight, um, all of the uh, great presentations we had from the kids. Um, I think that the, uh, the, well, sort of the action plan put forward by the superintendent is a positive step. Uh, as you know, I always have 100 questions, and there are definitely, I see 100 questions here that I have to ask uh, to you, and, and a lot of things that the uh, board here needs to discuss to kind of hash out uh, how we move forward. But uh, I think this evening was positive um, because, you know, two months ago we had, you know, over 100 people in, in a room with over 20 parents 
uh, pouring their guts out to us on television. And uh, I think um, I want to commend those parents again for coming forward. And uh, I know that uh, I've heard you and uh, that, uh, you know, parents continue to keep coming forward. And I continue to encourage uh, to come to us to, to help you with your issues and that uh, hopefully we can all move forward to find solutions to these issues. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do want to thank all the students that came out tonight, parents, administrators, teachers, especially the roasters back there. It was a good cup of coffee. Thank you. Um, I, I too appreciate your presentation, Jeff. I know you've been working on more than what you presented tonight. I know you can talk about so much. It was great to see the positive uh, follow-up. Um, it was also very nice to see uh, the students talking about the programs themselves. In fact, I don't know if Jamie's there tonight, but uh, she saw it on the agenda. That was a great idea. I don't think we do enough of that. And perhaps that's just one additional mechanism that we can use for our communication plan is we're going to just have a bunch of boring adults up there speak about what we do. I think it hits closer to home when students actually themselves can talk about it, their experiences. I know I listened more to that. Not that I don't listen to you, but, uh, but I thought it was a nice, positive um, portrayal. I had a, wasn't sure what we're going to talk tonight about the follow-up to the forum. Um, I don't think this seems a good, really good forum to talk about action plans, board responses. I know a couple meetings back, we're still trying to get our thoughts around that meeting. Uh, so having said that, and I'm glad you brought up the school safety committee idea. Uh, if we can for the next board of ed meeting, maybe a couple agenda items, is have a discussion on that topic, a little further input from the board. Now we have about a couple months to think about that. Um, and if the public would show up and get some input, that'd be great too. And second, it'd be great if the board actually had a discussion about the March 18th meeting and where our head's at, uh, what we'd like to see done and how we measure progress going forward. So. Uh, Madam Chair, write and send you an email for your agenda. Just tell you now, let's get those on the agenda and talk about it. We also have less than two and a half months, if that, in this current school year before we close shop. Um, <clears throat> I would make one more suggestion, if possible, that we consider having another forum, uh, perhaps toward the middle end of June, so that by then we have a little more experience with what's going on with the solutions, progress, and give those parents a chance to come back at the end of the school year this year and talk about what they've seen for progress and share what we've learned and done. I think that would be a good idea, and so I'm dedicated for that. So let's consider that. We can talk about it the next meeting. But overall, thank you for the, uh, for the positive feedback tonight. It's glad to see these things work, and you know, um, looking to measure these things and make sure to move forward. Thank you. Um, I would also like to thank everyone who came and participated and asked questions. Um, I am always very uh, impressed by our students and how they care about each other. Um, that has come up in a number of different contexts. Um, and so I think overall, we have a lot to be proud of. Um, a lot of good work is being done. And hopefully, that is becoming more apparent to uh, parents in the community. Um, but you know, as Mr. Perugini said, it's always great to hear directly from the students because they are you know, they're living it and they're really, um, they're such an impressive bunch of kids. So uh, with that, I think I will call for a motion to adjourn. Ms. Hellreich. I did want to also thank the students that came today and presented. I was really impressed. Fantastic job. Um, I had a question, and I was going to wait to ask this individually, but it just struck me that maybe I should ask it now because some of the programs I heard about were so fantastic. Challenge Day, the, the leadership programs for the students. I was wondering if there was a way to make those more inclusive, to include more students in those opportunities, and I don't know if it's possible, um, but you know, I, I think I heard there was um, 100 students for Challenge Day, and I'm not sure exactly the numbers for the leadership initiatives, even Cheshire High, Dodd, and elementary schools. But just thinking about how fantastic they were and what an impact they had on the students that were able to participate, I kind of feel bad for the ones that weren't included and didn't have the, 
the chance to be part of it. And was just wondering if there was a way for us to expand those programs to include more of our students so everyone has the same benefit. That was just a thought. Thank, thanks, Ms. Foddy. Um, anyone else have anything to? Okay. All right, then I will call for a motion to adjourn. Ms. Hellreich, do I have a second? Ms. Sobel, all in favor? Thank you. We are adjourned. And feel free to stay and talk to any of us at this point. <laughs>